Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, although I'm a graduate of uh, your sister school, Robert Wood Johnson, uh, I actually uh, had a cup of coffee uh, here uh, in 1972 uh, at New Jersey Medical School. And I remember the major teaching hospital being Martland, and I remember the Quonset huts uh, where where we went to get interviewed and everyone was over there and and so it's you know I, I have the same kind of appreciation and amazement that many of you do of uh, what a wonderful campus it is here what a wonderful uh, learning institution and I'm glad to be here at your uh, alumni association uh, day uh, we're going to talk about the patient-centered medical home uh, how many of you have heard that uh, that term patient-centered medical home Okay, wow, good, great. So uh, that's, that's a good start, uh, at least to have the eyes glaze over in terms of what the heck is this. Uh, what we're gonna do is go through what our problems are with our current system. What are we trying to fix? Uh, then talk a little bit about the contribution of primary care and what's it like in New Jersey? What's the need for a new model of care and defining the patient-centered medical home. What is the definition of this? Because we all have a little bit different view. Um, what's the evidence that it works? And how do we align the patient-centered medical home with other larger concepts, such as the medical neighborhood and uh, accountable care organizations? So let's start with the problems with our uh, current system. Uh, first of all, as we know, it's damn expensive. Uh, if you look at this, this is through uh, 2004, this slide, and uh, you can see that uh, compared to the other countries that we typically compare ourselves to in terms of cost of care, um, we're twice what they are. Uh, and uh, this curve, unfortunately, is only escalating. Uh, the percentage of GDP that we now spend on health care is 17 percent. And as someone once told me, the maximum number this can go to is 100. <laughs> so there is a cap on it. But uh, it was kind of interesting. I heard Don Berwick, uh, who was the former director of CMS and uh, really the father of uh, modern quality improvement, the founder of, uh, of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, talk last month about uh, health care and quality. And he made the point, as much of a guru and a pa as passionate as he, as he is about uh, quality, he said it's really right now about cost. Because this number is not only impairing things directly with, in terms of access to health care, but it's pushing out other priorities of our country, such as infrastructure and education. So uh, it's really uh, a, a very, very uh, critical uh, issue for us now. Um, and we have more and more people who are uninsured. This is just a snapshot between 99 and 2000 and 2004 and 2005. And you can see there are far more states in the, in the dark blue. Uh, and uh, if we look at it six years later, uh, we all know that uh, it's gotten worse. Uh, if for no other reason, uh, we've just gone through a, a recession. Uh, and I can tell you in my own practice over the last four years how many people have come in to see me or who do, or worse yet do not come in to see me because they do not have health insurance. Um, increasing prevalence and cost of, of care. Uh, so not only is things, are things getting more costly, but things are getting more complicated. Uh, over time, we're seeing uh, among Medi Medicare beneficiaries more and more people who have <clears throat> greater than five health care conditions. And as we know, as you start to accumulate multiple chronic health care conditions, the cost of care goes up dramatically. Um, not only is it costly, but it's very inefficient. Um, if you look at the percentage of healthcare expenditures on health on just pushing paper, on transactional costs, um, it's 7.3 percent in the United States, and 
The next lowest is Germany. Interestingly, Germany is, is the next highest to us, and Germany has the healthcare system that's closest to us in that it's, it's private-based and they have something like 500 private health insurers. Uh, by comparison, Medicare expenditures is running around three and a half, four percent, and that brings this this number down. If you didn't have Medicare on there, the number would be more like nine percent. Uh, healthcare premiums continue to go up at two to three times uh, uh, inflation. This is unsustainable. So the key issue is what's the medical CPI versus the regular CPI. And that's the gap. It is unsustainable arithmetically if the medical CPI is higher than the regular CPI. And that's what drives the increase in uh, total health care expenditures as a percentage of your GDP. And although you see this number going down, the major reason that this has gone down in the last few years is because of the recession. So obviously as the recession uh, starts to, um, as we start to recover economically, well, the whole healthcare infrastructure will start to drive this back up because we haven't fundamentally changed the, um, the model of how we uh, take, care, uh, take care of patients. And in fact, the, the PPACA um, healthcare reform uh, that was enacted by uh, Congress a few years ago mainly dealt with access. It dealt very peripherally uh, with actually how we deliver care and the attempt to try to bend the cost curve. We're last in access uh, in equity. Uh, the Commonwealth Funds Commission uh, ranked the United States last in providing residents with access to health care. We perform poorly on the ability to see a doctor, after hours care, out-of-pocket costs, and health care disparities. And I'll talk a little bit more about health care disparities uh, a little bit later. So now let's talk about primary care. What's the contribution of primary care to the health care equation? Well, if we look at countries that have low percentage of primary care, those are the ones in red, and we look at the countries that have high percentage of primary care uh, as a por portion of their whole uh, total health care delivery system, we can see that uh, every year from uh, 1970 through when this was uh, uh, the last time it was measured by Barbara Starfield uh, in around the year 2000, that <clears throat> very consistently there's higher premature mortality in countries that do not have a good primary care infrastructure. Um, a lot of people say, well, we spent a lot of money on um, health care and that should be good because the more we spend really should equate to better quality. Well, uh, there was an analysis done by the Commonwealth Fund and they've actually found that there's an inverse relationship between cost and quality uh, and that we kind of have this where we have the uh, places like New Hampshire, Utah, North Dakota, Iowa that are spending very, relatively little on annual Medicare spending, but their quality indices are uh, much higher. Um, and then we have places like Louisiana that spend the most per capita and have the poorest quality. And unfortunately, we're about, in terms of value, value being a, a, a a hybrid of cost and quality, we're in the bottom five there. We're high cost, low quality. Uh, now, let's take a look at where there are a lot of primary care physicians versus specialists. They tend to be in the low cost, high quality qu quadrant. And if you look at the ratio, when the ratio is poor, where there's lots of specialists and very few primary care physicians, including New Jersey, uh, we tend to be in the low value quadrant, which is high cost and low quality. So why should we uh, support primary care? Uh, four reasons, improvements in quality, reduction in cost of care, better access, and reduced health care disparity. So let's kind of go through that. Whoops. Uh, quality. Uh, states with higher ratios of primary care physicians to the population have better health care outcomes. You saw that. 
Uh, it was also, uh, the, these findings were repeated by the, uh, uh, re the research of uh, Barbara Starfield. Uh, the supply of primary care physicians are associated with an increase in lifespan and reduced lo low birth uh, weight rates. Uh, and that was uh, in uh, England and in both England and the United States. Each additional uh, primary care physician per 10,000 population uh, is associated with a decrease in mortality of, uh, of 3 to 10 percent. Uh, by the way, it's each additional percent increase. Uh, is uh, associated with a decrease in mortality of 3 to 10 percent, depending on the cause of death. According to the Center for Evaluative Clinical Sciences at Dartmouth, for patients with severe chronic illnesses, those who live in the United States relied, and rely more on primary care have lower Medicare spending, lower resource inputs, lower hospital utilization rates, and uh, better quality of care as measured by fewer ICU de deaths and higher composite quality score. Uh, each 1% increase in primary care is associated with a decrease of 503 admissions, almost 3,000 ED visits, and 512 surgeries. Uh, international and U.S. data demonstrate the relationships between primary care and uh, improved outcomes and reduced cost. In terms of access and disparities, we talked about that a few slides ago. This is very interesting. Uh, that um, when you, we've all heard lectures about access, uh, about uh, disparities in healthcare and disparities in access. Minorities have have uh, worse access, and uh, uh, they do not get the same services provided that um, uh, that uh, non-minorities and non-socioeconomically um, disadvantaged people uh, get. Uh, and there are health care disparities between men and women with the same diagnosis, same severity of illness, uh, especially uh, coronary heart disease. Men get uh, more uh, interventional and diagnostic testing. The interesting thing is that when people have access to a medical home, those disparities disappear. Um, in the white population, an increase of one primary care doc per 10,000 is associated with a reduction of, of 1.58 deaths per 100,000. In the black population, it's associated with, a, with almost a reduction of four deaths per 10,000 population. So if primary care is so good, uh, we should be having all of our medical students jumping into that. And I'm hearing some laughing, you know. Well, what's happening? Well, unfortunately, the trend is not good. Uh, if you look at family medicine, uh, here's the curve in terms of choice of specialty from uh, 1999 to 2007, and it's basically plateaued since then. Um, if you look at general pediatrics, we see a similar decline. And uh, general internal medicine has basically, uh, if, if you extend this out, it's fallen completely off the radar screen. In fact, at this point in time, general internal medicine as a career choice to, to fill the, the supply for primary care is a non-factor. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what will ha what's happening to all the people who are um, going into internal medicine residencies? Well, they're going into subspecialties, uh, and we're now starting to see a, a sharp increase of that uh, with, pedi with pediatricians. So let's take a look at New Jersey. How's New Jersey doing? Well, not well. Um, we rank either first or 50th uh, in almost everything, and whether uh, when we're ranking first in a, in a category, that's bad, and when we're ranking 50th, that's also bad. So if, if we take a look at inpatient uh, Part B spending per decedent uh, during the last two years of life, we have the number one um, highest cost uh, of any state in the union. 
Now, the interesting thing about this is this is a wonderful outcome study because at the end, all of the people in the study have exactly the same outcome. They all died, all right? It just takes you a heck of a lot more money to die if you live in New Jersey than anywhere else. Also, if you happen to live in New Jersey, you're going to see a heck of a lot more doctors uh, while you're dying. Uh, this is the number of physician visits per decedent in the last six months of life. And we have 41.5 uh, visits. And you can take you know, whatever uh, uh, you know, uh, other uh, place you want to compare it with. Uh, Vermont is 19 visits. Uh, so we're seeing a lot more doctors. Uh, but we're getting exactly the same outcome. Uh, here we're number 50th, uh, and that is uh, variation by state and ratio of primary care to specialist labor input. So uh, actually, we're not the worst because we have DC in here as 0 0.69, but of course, that's not a state. So that doesn't give us a whole lot of comfort that we're not worst there. But we have the highest ratio of specialist to primary care or, if you want, the lowest ratio of primary care to specialist. One way we're ranked 50th, the other way we're ranked first. Uh, the need for a new model of care. Uh, Jack Caldwell did a study a few years ago and found that uh, by the year 2025, we're going to need about 44,000 adult care generalists that we do not currently have. Um, and in New Jersey, it's even worse. New Jersey ha actually has the uh, highest percentage of family doctors in the country whose age are, is over 60. And unfortunately, I'm one of the people who contribute to that number. Um, so at some point, sooner rather than later, I'm actually going to be, rather than on the delivery side, uh, I'm going to be on the uh, demand for services side. Uh, will a new model of healthcare delivery affect projections of physician and uh, other healthcare provider shortages? That's really the, the, uh, the question. And what are the implications if universal coverage uh, occurs? Uh, we know that in Massachusetts, uh, when they enacted universal uh, coverage, the first crisis they had was access because there were not enough primary care uh, practitioners to uh, take care of them. Gaps in care coordination, primary care and specialists, um, kind of interesting. There, are no in, there was no information sent to pediatric uh, specialists 49% of the time, no feedback to primary care 55% of the time, uh, dissatisfaction uh, with the quality of referrals back and forth on both sides of the equation uh, is high. Uh, the emergency department, 30% of adults indicated uh, that their regular physician was not informed about the visit. Uh, for the hospital, 33% of adults with chronic conditions did not have a follow-up plans post-hospital discharge. Uh, we're starting to get the message on that, and there, in a, a lot of health systems, uh, there's a lot of more emphasis on uh, doing better transitions of care, but this is ideally one of the things that um, the patient-centered medical home is best set up to take care of. Uh, patients with a medical home actually reported better coordination between their regular provider and their specialist. Uh, and as you can see, the blue is the medical home, the white is the, uh, the regular source of care. And you can see in all of these uh, facets of uh, coordination of care, there was fairly significant improvement here. Now, it's not 100%, it's not perfect, there's a lot of work to do, but the gap was pretty significant saying that there's better coordination of care when we have a patient-centered medical home. So um, there are a lot of definitions of patient-centered medical home. Uh, National uh, Committee on Quality Assurance has a definition. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's a joint uh, definition that was created by the American Osteopathic Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Physicians, and the American Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, but I decided that I was going to make my own uh, definition. Uh, and uh, I'll go over that. But before I do, 
let's just talk about traditional care versus um, the new model. So in the traditional care, my patients are those who make appointments with me. So all I'm really focused on in the traditional model is who's coming in today. That's what I'm responsible for. In the new model, our patients are those who are registered with our medical home. So we're responsible for a population of patients, including people who um, maybe I haven't seen in a year or two years, but they are my responsibility and I'm responsible for helping them get better health outcomes uh, than uh, they uh, currently have. Patients' chief symptoms are the reasons uh, for, uh, for the visit versus we systematically assess all our patients' health care needs. So the patient comes in with a splinter. In the old model, I take care of the splinter. In the new model, the patient comes in with a splinter, but the, the patient hasn't had a mammogram in four years, and uh, they're diabetic and they haven't had a flu shot. Uh, I need to take care of those things at the same time that I'm taking care of the splinter. So I'm taking care of the presenting symptom or the chief complaint, but I'm looking at the whole person. Care is determined by today's problem and time available versus care is provided by a proactive plan to meet the patient's needs, including without visits. So uh, uh, having things such as e-correspondence, e-visits, um, engagement with the patients, having patients uh, send in blood pressure uh, logs are things that we need to think about uh, in the new model. Care varies by the schedule, time, and memory or skill of the doctor versus care is standardized according to evidence-based guidelines. Uh, and I told Robin uh, and Debbie a little while ago that, it was, that I had a hiatus of 10 years where I actually wasn't treating any patients before I went back into private practice. And I realized that if I didn't do something dangerous, uh, if I didn't do something different, I could be dangerous. Uh, and I didn't want to to be in that position. So I surrounded myself with every quality improvement thing, every electronic reference library, every uh, medical alert that I could possibly do uh, so that I could pr provide quality care to my patients. Now, 10 years later, you know, the, the, the ner learning curve has gone up like this. My age has gone up like this. So my my internal RAM is, is not too high anymore, and sometimes, uh, you know, I get one of these things to try to do a control-alt-delete on my frontal lobe, and it doesn't work. You know, so I'm relying a lot more on external sources of information. The interesting thing is patients no longer expect me to know everything, and they're very happy when they ask me a question and I say, hey, let's look it up together, and I turn the monitor and, and we take a look at it. So you can go through uh, th these other things, but this is an example of the difference between today's care and, or the traditional care and where we really want to be going with the patient-centered medical home. So here's my definition. It's a table. The table has four legs, a tabletop that ties it together, and a base or a platform that it sits on. So let's go through uh, the four legs, the tabletop, and the platform. So the first leg is enhanced access. What does enhanced access mean? It means the patients get seen when they want, where they want, by whom they want. Use of data and technology, we talked a little bit about that and I'll give you some, uh, some examples uh, a little bit later. We'll go through each one of these facets, uh, including the tabletop and the base. Population-based care, talked about that. My patients are not just the patients who are coming in today, it's the entire population that I've been caring for for the last 25, uh, well, it, 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 for, for me it, it includes 3,500 patients. Those, there are 3,500 patients who are active in my practice um, that are cared for by myself and my nurse practitioner. Uh, and those who are, those are the people I'm responsible for. 3,500 who've seen me in the last two years, all right? It's not just the 25, 30, or 40 who come in that day. And team-based care. So uh, I know that when I was trained um, as a doctor, uh, you'd go into morning report and you say, oh, Mrs. Jones came in and she had uh, pneumonia and uh, the grand stain uh, showed uh, uh, diplococci. 
uh, and the uh, rounding person or the chief resident would say, did you look at the gram stain yourself? And the model we were trained in is that everything revolved around the doctor. The doctor was omniscient, omnipresent, uh, uh, superhuman, knew everything. Well, the reality was I probably looked at a half a dozen gram stains, and there was a uh, technician who actually looks at that's all she does, or he does. Who, does, who is capable of interpreting a gram stain better? myself or the technician who is specifically trained for that job. And so the new model, we really have to understand that we all have unique skills that we bring uh, to the patient care setting and we need to rely on each other. It's not where the doctor is at the hub of the wheel. You know, we're one spoke. So what are the, what's the base, uh, the, the, the the table platform that ties these four legs together. Well, the good thing is that's the enduring aspects of primary care that hasn't changed since I was a medical student. And it's con continuity of care, it's uh, comprehensive care, and it's having a therapeutic relationship with the patient. But it has to rest on a base, and the base is payment reform, because you can't do this uh, on the existing uh, hamster care uh, method of payment where we're, we're getting paid only on a fee-for-service basis and uh, I'm running with my short legs faster and faster and faster and getting nowhere. In fact, uh, when I call my colleagues, they ask me, uh, are you on or off the hamster wheel right now? And, and that's the way we refer to, uh, you know, the current model or the traditional model. So let's go through each of these uh, areas. Enhanced use of data and technology. So I did this slide about um, four or five years ago for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And this is my office, uh, or actually this was my office uh, five years ago. Now in Robin's um, uh, introduction, you did not not hear anything about me having a, uh, a master's of medical informatics or a uh, degree in information technology. Uh, and I, I'm not uh, on the nerd scale terribly uh, proficient. You know, I've got an iPhone and an iPad and that's about it. But this is pretty uh, complicated and it's actually gotten more complicated. Uh, but this is really what you have to have in terms of being able to, um, to uh, relate to your patients in a patient-centered medical home. The hub is the electronic health record. There's electronic scheduling. There's a patient portal that's integrated with the electronic health record so that the patient can see uh, their records uh, and uh, uh, what services they need. There's secure email so that they can interact directly uh, with you. That can be also integrated with your patient uh, portal. Uh, obviously, the traditional things of electronic claims processing there's uh, electronic kiosks that I uh, interact directly with your electronic health records so patients can register uh, with you and add personal health information and it goes directly uh, into uh, the record. E-prescribing, interactive websites, uh, e-visits, uh, interfaces with labs and hospitals, uh, etc. So it, it can get pretty hairy uh, and the interesting thing is, you know, you can't take a box, you know, that comes from Dell, open it up and plug it in and have this. Uh, I probably have 10 or 15 vendors that I've had to use to cobble together uh, this kind of infrastructure. So let's talk about a, a few of these features. A patient portal can uh, provide accessible medical records. Patients can view their medication list and refill requests. They can view their problem lists. They can view uh, past lab records, uh, past uh, consultation reports, uh, uh, radiology reports, uh, they can request appointments, and they can do secure messaging directly to uh, any one of the healthcare team that's part of the uh, patient-centered medical home. So this is a, a Kaiser Permanente um, patient portal and uh, the patient logs on and this is the view. They can see who they saw, when they saw it, and then they can click on here and drill down and see the details of, of what was done. 
they can also get access to an electronic reference uh, library. Uh, and you see up top, they can request uh, appointments, refills, uh, et cetera. Um, this is a patient recommendation report that I use. Uh, this actually gets printed uh, in piece of, uh, as a piece of paper. It's not a, a portal. Uh, remember I told you that when that patient comes in with a splinter that has um, other health care needs, whether it's chronic care management needs or preventive health care needs, we want to identify those and we want to accomplish them at the time that I'm taking care of the splinter. Well, the way we do it in our practice is that this report gets uh, printed out and these action items here are all of those issues. The perform a hemoglobin A1C, document a pap smear, uh, document advanced directive status, uh, order a mammogram, uh, order a lipid panel. So this patient could be coming in for something totally unrelated to uh, diabetic care, yet these recommendations are coming out. They're evidence-based, based on looking at our uh, extracting data from my electronic health record. Now, my medical assistant gets this piece of paper every morning, and so she executes these orders as standing orders for me based on evidence-based guidelines. She does not have to inter to uh, uh, interact with me and say, Dr. Itis, is it okay if I give this diabetic patient a flu shot? It's already written there. She's not practicing above her license. She's practicing uh, under direct electronic supervision uh, by me. And so this is a way of getting everyone to practice at the top of their license and harnessing uh, the ability of the team. Um, here's another uh, uh, electronic message. This goes directly from the practice uh, to the patient. Uh, and, uh, you know, we like these uh, red, yellow, green um, um, color coordinated um, flags for patients. And uh, the patient then gets this automatically that tells them what services they're overdue for. Again, this comes uh, from uh, uh, from Kaiser Permanente. So re on a regular basis, uh, the patients will be getting notification on uh, overdue chronic care management services and overdue uh, preventive services. Well, let's take a look at the next uh, leg, which is enhanced access. Uh, patients can easily make appointments and select the day and time. Waiting times are short. Email and telephone consults are offered. So access does not mean that the patient has to be physically present uh, in the practice to get uh, health care services and off-hour services available. Uh, so what are some of the ways that we do this? Same day appointments, open access scheduling. Open access scheduling means that um, depending on how you do it, some or even all of your slots are completely open that day and patients call up that day to book the appointments and there's no advanced scheduling. And patients are guaranteed in return that they can be seen uh, on the day they want, uh, where they want, by whom they want. And e-visits are structured visits. It's not email correspondence saying, hey doc, I've got an earache, but it's, uh, it's e-visits are, are structured logic, branch uh, logic algorithms. So the patient calls up and say, listen, I have um, uh, facial pressure and uh, a purulent discharge from my nose. And from that, there's a structured series of branched uh, medical logic uh, questions that the patient asks. I get them in, in a secure portal. I review them. And based on the information, I can make a decision as to whether or not to treat the patient. Uh, do I have enough information or do I want the patient then to come into the office to be seen because I, I don't have enough information. Population-based care, uh, patient registries, uh, we look at aggregate data and patient-specific data where we can drill down uh, and identify patients who are either are not at goal, meaning their hemoglobin A1C is 9, for example, or they're in need of services so that they um, maybe need a, a colonoscopy. So this is a, an aggregate report 
that is done, again, red, yellow, green. It goes to a person called a care manager or a care coordinator who works in the, in the practice, or we call this person a panel manager. And actually, uh, when it's done this way, it really can, does not have to be given to a nurse. Uh, in my practice, I use a medical assistant to do this. Uh, and uh, the medical assistant can, I, it can uh, identify patients who need services. They're overdue for services, uh, or uh, for example, here, uh, this patient has a hemoglobin A1C that's elevated, and maybe then we would look to see whether or not there's any new appointments. And if the patient had an elevated A1C with no new appointment, that's a flag to say maybe that patient uh, needs to come in. Tracking system, this is a, a screenshot from my own office. So you give a patient a prescription for a mammogram or a colonoscopy or what have you, uh, your job isn't done because you don't get credit for just prescribing the right thing. You only get credit when the patients actually receive the service. So in this situation, we have a report that can identify uh, that we ordered a colonoscopy on uh, January 22, 2009. Uh, the patient hasn't yet gotten that service, but it's not yet gotten to the 90-day window where it automatically goes into the overdue uh, situation. And so again, this is something that your medical assistant can look at and identify patients who are overdue for services that you've done. Uh, the abnormal pap smear, uh, the patient that you gave a prescription for a mammogram uh, and they never went. Uh, the patient who was advised to go for the colonoscopy and never went. And this is the way, by systematically looking at populations, we can drive improved uh, performance in terms of preventive care and improving uh, care of patients with chronic illness. Uh, this is another report. This is a little bit older, not as fancy, but it shows patients who have blood, who have hypertension or hyperlipidemia who haven't been in in six months. So I can look at my patients who maybe they're under control, but they, they need to come in uh, to be seen uh, for a follow-up. And then we want to roll that up into aggregate performance. And this is a busy slide, but you, know, you can see there's a bar, uh, a bar graph, and it really doesn't matter what that is for, uh, but you can see I can track it over months. So I can see month by month, how am I doing in terms of the percentage of patients who are diabetic who have had a, a, an A1C recently? Or how am I doing in terms of uh, what percentage of my diabetic patients have an A1C that's uh, under 7.5 or under 8 or wherever you want to have it? So I can see, is the trend going in the right direction or is the trend going in the wrong direction? Patient engagement and care. Patient have, has the option of being in, informed and engaged partners in their care. Practices provide information on treatment plans, preventive and follow-up care, reminders, uh, access to medical records, assistance with self-care and uh, counseling. So the concept here is that the patients are no longer passive where they're coming in and uh, we are providing information on a semi-dictorial basis in terms of uh, what should be done. In fact, there's tremendous study, uh, amount of literature that patients who feel that they're in control of their illness, that they're in charge rather than the doctor, have much better outcomes uh, than, than people who are using the, the doctor for not only information but for decision making. There are a number of ways we can engage patients. Uh, a few of them I'll talk about uh, team huddles. Uh, so in the morning, we, we get together, our nurse, our medical assistant, uh, and uh, myself, and we go through who's coming in that day and what are the services that, that they need so we can systematically plan that. We talked about the patient registry. Motivational interviewing is a new technique done now to help people with lifestyle motivations uh, to assist them in, um, in taking charge of, of their own behavioral issues and, and lifestyle uh, challenges. So it's not, doc, give me a, a, a diet because I have to lose weight. Uh, it's a very different conversation now that we have. Team-based care is the fourth leg. Um, we have some definitions of what a team is. I think they're all familiar with to you. 
the interesting thing to me is how different a practice is that really has a true team versus the traditional model that I was trained on uh, as a resident. Uh, so uh, you can see you have the, the physician and, uh, that's surrounded by the practice team and the patient that's surrounded by uh, the community and the family. And the practice team can include a nurse practitioner, a PA, a uh, nurse, medical assistant, uh, office staff, uh, nutrition educators, et cetera, et cetera. In my own practice, which up until recently was a solo practice, I had a family nurse practitioner, or I have a family nurse practitioner. I have uh, two medical assistants, one who functions as a panel manager, which I talked about. We have a care coordinator who also functions as a health coach. Uh, we just recently hired a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Uh, and then we have liaison and outreach into the community uh, as well. So that's an example of creating a medical team. There's no one prescription for exactly how you do it. Uh, it's based on what your needs are, what you can afford, uh, and what the resources are that are available. Whoop. What did I do? I did something very bad here. There we go. I won't do that again. Um, the enduring aspects of primary care, continuity, longitudinal relationships, and comprehensive care. Let's go through them. Uh, continuity means that uh, if I'm in a group of 10 providers, and patients see us, do they see a new provider every time? Or do they see the same provider every time? You know, that's uh, an issue of continuity. Fragmentation of care gives worse outcomes. Also, uh, if a patient uh, is homebound, or if a patient's in a nursing home, or if a person is uh, in a hospital uh, in various settings, Am I involved in that care or am I not involved in that care? Longitudinal relationship uh, talks about how long have we known each other. And I think all of us know it's way, way, way easier to take care of a patient that you've known for 10, 15, 20 years. You walk in and you're really relaxed. And you have a conversation. And you have a trusting relationship. Uh, as opposed to the new patient. Hi, I'm Dr. Itis. Welcome to our practice. How are you referred here? Boy, you know, there's a lot of work to be done between that initial engagement and to the point where you really have a longitudinal therapeutic relationship. And comprehensive care uh, deals with the scope of services that I can actually provide to that uh, patient. Um, Across, adults across countries place high value on having accessible personal and coordinated care. Uh, the question was, when you need care, how important is it that you have one practice or clinic where doctors and nurses know you, provide and coordinate care that you need? And you see it's very high. I did a survey in my own practice, and uh, at the end of the survey, we asked, well, what do you like about this practice? and what's really important. And there were only three things. One was good access. The patients wanted to be seen when they needed to be seen. The second was, he said, it's important that Dr. Itis takes time and listens to me. And the third thing was, it's important we value in your practice that you have a care team that's friendly and knows me. You know, it's kind of like the old uh, Cheers, uh, you know, uh, uh, thing. Yeah, right. Um, and, and that's what they want, whether it's the neighborhood bar or the family doctor's office. They want a, a care team that knows them, you know. Uh, payment reform. Uh, so that's the, the base. We've talked about the, the four legs. We've talked about the tabletop. Let's talk about the base. Um, for every 4.7 hours, that is spent in direct face-to-face -face patient care. Uh, in this survey that was done um, uh, with um, 11 full-time family physicians from eight practices in 2003, for every 
hours that they were spending in direct patient care, they were spending another 3.9 hours doing clinical stuff, but not where the patient was in the room. Why is that important? Because in the current model, that's not reimbursable. All right. So almost 50% of our time is spent in non-reimbursable activities uh, in primary care. 41% uh, of primary care services are not reimbursed by procedure-based fee-for-service methodology. And then payment for procedure-based uh, care, when you do it, is often three times greater than uh, for uh, payment for primary care. So I'll get if a patient comes in and they have earwax and I wash their ears out, which uh, if you're in medical education, you know, that's not a terribly complicated thing to teach someone how to do, uh, versus counseling a depressed patient for 15 or 20 minutes, I'll actually get paid 1.5 times uh, uh, what I do for counseling a patient for, for washing out someone's ears. Uh, Median income of primary care physicians is approximately half that of specialists. So we didn't talk about that, you know, what's, what are the issues that are driving people into, spe, uh, into subspecialty care and away from primary care. It's really lifestyle and, and money. So we need to have a new payment model. Uh, the new payment model needs to have fee for service uh, certainly still on there, perhaps with some special add-on codes for things such as uh, telephonic counseling or service after hours. Then there needs to be a prospective payment for care coordination. So all the things I talked about with panel managers and care coordinators, we need to have a payment that's prospective, not for the 25 patients that are seen that day, but for the 3,500 patients that I'm responsible for. And finally, to the extent that I'm uh, capable of increasing value by increasing quality or bending the cost curve, uh, we need to get some type of reward in terms of pay for performance or shared savings. What's the evidence that PCMH works? Uh, community care of North Carolina, 17% decrease in emergency uh, department visits uh, by Medicaid patients under the age of 21, and over $250 million in annualized savings on the Medicaid population using this model. Geisinger developed a, a network-wide electronic health record. They put uh, embedded care coordinators in the practices, and they had a reduction in, in admission of 13% and a reduction of total cost of care of 8%. You have to understand, Geisinger already was one of the most efficient healthcare delivery systems in the country, and they still were able to get an 8% benefit using this model. Group health of, of uh, Seattle, I think they kind of had the, the full Monty of PCMH. Uh, they got everything. This was a multidisciplinary team-based care. They got improved access, improved patient satisfaction, redu reduction in cost of care, improved quality. They, re they were able to reduce panel size, physician panel size, right, where at the same time they improved access. And perhaps most importantly, they reduced physician burnout. Uh, talk for a minute or two about the medical neighborhood. Patient-centered medical home can't do it at all. We have to be tied in to our specialist colleagues and our hospitals and other services. Uh, so if we don't do that, we are going to be losing efficiency uh, across the whole spectrum of care. Uh, we, have to, and patient, we have to recognize that patients don't all access care through the patient-centered medical home. They may at, might access care directly through the hospital, the emergency department, or a, a specialist office. So what are the elements that we look at in the medical neighborhood? Coordination of care, consistent communication, <coughs> seamless transitions, sharing of information, each party playing the role, and having collaborative care agreements, formal agreements between primary care physicians and other pro providers. What do primary care uh, physicians operating medical homes expect from their non-PCP specialty colleagues, understand and assume the appropriate role in the patient's care. So are, is the care being transferred to you? That very often happens with a patient who's going, undergoing active chemotherapy. Um, are you going to be providing ongoing specific care for a, a unique uh, healthcare condition? Or do I want you just to consult and refer back? 
uh, avoid secondary referrals. So the cardiologist who sees the patient and then refers the patient directly to a pulmonologist, we want to avoid that. Uh, prompt and effective communication, cost-effective care, evidence-based care, use of effective ancillaries, uh, whether or not that's um, uh, labs, uh, diagnostic uh, facilities, full disclosure to patients if you have any uh, financial incentives, do you own the surgery center? If you're a urologist, uh, do you employ the pathologist or the, uh, uh, the, the robot? Uh, and collaborative care agreements with uh, primary care physicians and, and follow-up discussions to see how it's going. Uh, finally, last thing is medical homes and accountable care organizations. Uh, we all know right now that the ACO is the, the hot item on the block. We have to recognize that the ACO, the building block of the ACO is the PCMH, whether or not this is a commercial population or um, a Medicare population. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, to uh, have recently been uh, awarded in New Jersey one of the seven regions in the country where we're going to have a pilot CMS Dem four-year demonstration using uh, the uh, PCMH and medical neighborhood um, uh, model. Uh, that's not exactly ACO, but it, it, it is, uh, it's a feather in our cap that we've, we've gotten that, and it really is a boost to the PCMH mo movement in New Jersey. Um, in ACOs, PCPs can only participate in one ACO because they have to attribute our patients to one accountable care organization. They can't split them up, saying some of them are in one and some are in another. Uh, more importantly, medical homes are viewed as the foundation and essential building block of ACOs. So to summarize, despite the Affordable Care Act, healthcare quality in the United States remains dysfunctional with problems of cost, quality, and access, a strong primary care infrastructure has been shown in the United States and worldwide to be uh, essential in addressing these issues as well as improving health care disparities. There's a strong need in the U.S. not only to re reinforce the primary care infrastructure but to, be, to establish a new model of primary care that's team-based and patient-centered. The patient-centered medical home has been shown to consistently improve access, improve quality, and lower cost across a wide spectrum of populations, including the medically uninsured indigent, Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial populations. Physicians working in medical home will be reaching out to colleagues in other specialties and hospitals to create medical neighborhoods, and the medical uh, home is an essential building block of the accountable care organization. So at this point, uh, I will stop. It's uh, been a pleasure to uh, be with you on your uh, alumni uh, reunion day, and uh, I'll be glad to uh, take a few questions if anyone has them. Yeah. Is the ACO part of the healthcare? Is the ACO part of the healthcare reform bill, or is it independent of? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it is tied to the healthcare reform bill. Uh, it's probably if the Supreme Court. Um, uh, overturns the, the uh, PPACA, most likely this would be one of the elements that would be enduring because it's, it's an area that does have bipartisan support because it's, uh, A, it's, it's marketplace solution, uh, it's not a governmental solution, and B, it's 